reactions often come from the nervous system. Mm. So when you're looking at an individual's range of movements, don't always assume it's the muscles and the ligaments and stuff that are restricting that range. Mm. I'd say nine times out of ten, there is a neural component to it. So there's a guy called David Butler, and David Butler talks about adverse neural tension. And when you talk about flossing, so nerve glides, nerve tensioners, those principles come from David Butler. And I think when you're looking at, you know, as, as a as a PT working with clients, I don't think there's anything wrong throwing in some tensioners and gliders in order to establish or re-establish normal range of movement for your clients. You know, when people say they feel tightness, it's often not a muscular tightness or it's not always a muscular tightness. I think you have to consider the nervous system in that uh, context. And the, um, can you name off the top of your head the sprinter um, who's, hamstring completely went but he was running about three days two three days later do you know that story or in the no, no. it's a really it's the really famous sprinter um at the, at the olympics who dad came out of the stands and helped him over. oh yeah yeah Derek redmond that's the one Derek redmond. Yeah. And, yeah, Derek redmond. Um, people thought it was a complete hamstring tear it wasn't that was neurological yeah yeah so for those guys that have turned up for today's session i think you are more forward thinking than a lot of your counterparts and I think as a result these are things that you need to be starting to take into your uh, into your practice with clients because it it's it's a game changer you know the stuff that we do therapeutically you make some dr really dramatic changes you floss someone's hamstring what they perceive as their hamstring is the sciatic nerve and all of a sudden they've gone from you know having zero range of movements, you know, almost pain when they're tightness when they get them just literally off the bed to the point where you'd back up to 90 degrees, full range of movement, that kind of stuff. So, yeah, I think it's very relevant for, for PTs, therapists, everybody. Mm. And um, so, so what, we, what we want to go through today, I'll just, I'll chat for a bit while, sorry, can you get the um, anatomy up on and, and your computer? Uh, so, you yeah. through. so practical, practical application. You have got a client on the gym floor and they're feeling something and then you're saying like, oh, that, that feels like a little bit weird. Um, you know, I think that feels like I'm getting pain or I'm getting tingling sensation in my hand or something it doesn't feel right. And with nerves, it's a different kind of sensation to the normal training. If there's a nerve impingement, then you've got to think it really, really, really simple is that if it's just a wire, it's a telephone wire from the main socket, which we'll say is the brain, and it's going into something, the appliance that's working, that's the muscle. So I just want it to be a very simple concept. If there is a muscle, or, well, mainly a muscle or possibly a bony structure, so as a joint bone, um, you know, tendon, anything, which is compressing that wire, it's like somebody standing on it and really pushing into it quite aggressively and then rubbing the foot into it and um, irritating it. Now, obviously, it's not as simple as uh, if there's a wire on the floor and we step on it, it cuts off the power. But if we apply a lot of force and there's a grating on that nerve, we get nerve irritation in some format. Now, if you know where these nerves run, and um, especially when we're looking at the <laughs> anterior compartment of the, uh, of the chest, um, and when we're looking at the uh, posterior compartment and well anterior compartment of the um, of the lumbar plexus, so the lower body, you can start to see where there is amounts of compression and what muscles might be affected by that. So probably one that um, Aaron's come across with quite a lot is anterior tilt of the pelvis, um, and there's a compression on the like femoral nerve, and then the person's having issues firing up the quad. Now we talk about internal and external mechanics quite a bit, and we look about we look at how to create these really cool exercises using external mechanics, like using bands and chains and different machine setups. But if there's a nerve compression, that isn't ever going to address the matter because they you need to open up the structure or at least try uh, add some traction or some flossing to get that nerve um, flowing if you can. So taking away the compression around that, and we can go one further, and this is where spinal mechanics are essential is that is if the spine is compressed and somebody has a lateral tilt or they have a slight rotation, if you think about the, the uh, nerve endings that are coming out of uh, the dorsal root of the, of the, spinal, um, of the spinal column itself, so I suppose where the anatomy would help to see, is that if there is a slight twist and contortion in the vertebra and there's a compression where the signal's going out, so it's afferent, 
afferent nervous system? Efferent or afferent? I'm pretty sure it's afferent. But the, um, the nervous system can, have, um, it can, have, um, can be impaired when actually sending that signal out. And one of the things which I don't know is 100% a, um, a concept. I don't know if it's um, the literature or the science behind it. But again, if you've got a client who is pressing weights and the, the most common one I see is like a dumbbell or a shoulder press, and then suddenly they just go, loss of power. Has anyone ever had that with a client or themselves where suddenly they've just gone, no, that's just completely given way. Um, it can sometimes be dangerous. It's something like they're just pushing. There's no power there. Now, I'm, I, I, you know, I haven't looked at anybody under EMG. I haven't looked at what's going on. But the way I see that, if there's a sudden loss of power, there's just been an impingement on the nerve um, which is suddenly the signaling just isn't firing sufficiently and that whole kind of um, coordination and muscle contraction has been, has been weakened to a point where it's just fatigued. Um, so where this comes into play is that, yes, we talk about mobility from a muscle perspective, but is opening up nerve roots and opening up um, kind of structures with the nerves even more important than stretching and mobility? And, and I, would, I would say yes. In management of lower back pain, the, the flossing of the sciatic nerve uh, and making sure it has no obstructions is very, very important. Um, so that's why we've got to always look at our spinal health and look at, um, you, know, you know, people who are sat down all day, that's just compression, compression, compression of them posterior structures. Um, so that's why the, like, so the spinal flossing and the, the uh, sciatic nerve flossing is very effective. Um, you got everything there, Aaron? Yeah, do you want the lumbar sacral plexus first? <clears throat> we'll, go, we'll go sacral plexus first. And, yeah. Uh, and what I'll do is I'll... Do you want me to... Do you want to have I got access to be able to share the screen? Yep, so you are now the host. Perfect. Right, let's get on to that. Um, share screen. There. Right, so... Can you all see that? Give me a thumbs up or a nod. Yeah. So the, the lumbosacral plexus, so this is essentially the nerve supply to your lower limb. Now these derive from uh, something called the chorda equina. So the, L, the spinal cord finishes at L1, but it doesn't go all the way down to the bottom of your spine, it stops at L1. From L1 down, you've got this thing that looks a bit like a, on dissection, looks a bit like a horse's tail. And it's called the chorda equina. And you've probably heard of chorda equina syndrome, which is essentially where you get a big central disc prolapse, start to put pressure on the S2, S3, and S4 nerve roots, and your client then starts complaining of bowel and bladder dysfunction. So they usually become incontinent, and they usually get saddle anesthesia. So that's a, a compression of the nerve roots if, as they're emanating from the spine. But as we go down through the pelvis, you then start to the nerves collect together and start to form named peripheral nerves. So when we talk about a nerve root, we're talking about the bit that comes out of the spine. Those nerve roots join up with other nerve roots and they essentially form named peripheral nerves. And as Chris was just talking about there, some of the more common named nerves that you're gonna come across. The one that runs in the front, is the femoral nerve, so the thing that supplies the anterior fascial compartments of your leg, which is that bit there, is the femoral nerve, and that's composed of the L2, L3, and L4 nerve roots. And then at the back, we have the sciatic nerve, which you've probably heard about. Now the sciatic nerve is actually two, nerve, two nerves together, bound together. So you've got the <clears throat> tibial nerve and something called the common perineal nerve. Now these are bound together in a sheath. And I think when people complain of sciatica, what they're usually complaining of, it, the, the sheath, which is much like a conduit, Chris used the analogy of an electric cable. Now an electric cable, if it's in the wall, has to have a conduit that protects it from the plaster that goes over the top of it. So the sheath in this situation is essentially the same as the conduit. The nerve is the electric cable. And those two nerves run the same sheath. And when there's compression, this isn't necessarily from discs, tight muscles can cause the same degree of compression. Um, you've probably all heard of piriformis syndrome, which is an example of when you get a tight muscle and that starts to cause, cause uh, compression onto the nerve. And that then gives rise to these weird and wonderful symptoms into the leg. Now, 
contrary to popular belief, as Chris was just saying, nerve pain isn't always characterized by pins and needles, numbness, changes in sensation. And, and that's different to what, you know, when we teach this stuff to students, those are the signs and symptoms that we tend to talk about. But usually people complain when they've got nerve problems, it's tightness. It's a deep kind of tightness in their glute region or the hamstring or the side of the leg. Now, as we talked about at the start, you or I, when we were first, you know, dealing with these people from a PT perspective, would then think about stretching those uh, tight muscles out. When in fact, stretching, because it's nerve and it's not elastic, stretching usually makes things worse. So it might feel better temporarily, but once you come out of the stretch, it feels tighter than it did beforehand because essentially nervous tissue doesn't like to stretch. And when you stretch it, it kicks off. And it kicks off in the sense that it gets, it feels tighter or it starts to give weird symptoms into the, into the, the sort of periphery. So that's your lumbosacral plexus that emanates from the lower part of your spine. And like I say, I think the main ones you're going to need to know about from a, um, a PT perspective, femoral nerve, which supplies the quadriceps, sciatic nerve, which is two nerves together. So the tibial portion, the sciatic nerve supplies the hamstrings. The tibial portion of the sciatic nerve supplies gastroc and soleus and all of the posterior leg muscles. And then the common perineal portion of the sciatic nerve, which is the other nerve that's combined in the same sheath, that supplies the perineals and some of the anterior fascial compartments of your leg, the muscles we talked about last week, anterior tibialis, Extensor lucis longus, extensor digitorum, those sort of muscles there. Are you still with me, Chris? I'm still with you. I hear the obturator as well, would you worth saying? Yeah, yeah. So from, an, so from a, an adductor perspective, the obturator nerve obviously supplies the, the three adductor muscles on the inside. But I rarely see, and again, I jump in if you feel, Chris, I rarely see the adductor nerve problems, it's usually the femoral nerve or sciatic nerve or some portion of the sciatic nerve. I've seen these problems. And, and in terms of do we see the obturator nerve, it's not something I look to diagnose. The only thing from a treatment perspective is that I, I will, if I'm ever using needles, I never go um, near the, that region, medial yeah. anterior compartment with a needle or even with compression just because of the um, the nerves, the amount of nerves there, that's a very sensitive and obviously from a um, from an actual treatment perspective, that's a sensitive area, you know, from a one-to-one -one perspective, you understand, because obviously you're in the groin, but um, from in terms of a heavy compressive, um, I'd say that what I like is spinal stabilization whilst we open up the, um, as we go into abduction, abduction, so that would be stabilizing the lower back through like intra-abdominal pressure whilst opening up and using the abduction movement to, um, as, a, as a, flossing of the, um, a flossing of the nerves rather than trying to just stretch that area because usually the more abduction we'll go into, the more anterior tilt we'll do and that defeats the purpose of the, if you think about where, if we're, if we're trying to avoid compression of the nerves, that, so that would be um, my go-to with that one, is it has to come yeah. And I think it's one of those areas that your massage therapist, when they're working into the sort of inside upper part of your groin, mm. it's tender, they'll tell you that's the tendons of the adductors that are tender. Mm. And they say, yeah, that needs to be stripped out. That's really tight in there. And actually what it is, it's, it's a nerve plexus and it's a fairly delicate nerve plexus, mm -hmm. very superficial. So keep them away, for, for lots of reasons, keep them out of your groin. Yeah. Um, so I think in terms of like stuff that you can take away from this, now I'll give you a little example. So about 10 years ago, I was deadlifting. Um, and I'd been deadlifting for a few, good few years. One Saturday morning, went in, um, warmed up, did all the usual stuff. Got into about my second, third, fourth warm-up sets. Felt something go in my back and I prolapsed the disc. Now I had the worst sciatica I think known to man well at least it was the worst sciatica known to this man um, and I did the usual stuff you know I did Smith McKenzie exercises and I did some flossing 
and I did some hot and cold stuff to try and distract myself from the intolerable pain that was in my leg. I slept on the floor because I couldn't sleep in the bed because it was the, the curve in the mattress, put my back into such an uncomfortable position. Um, I couldn't sleep. Anyway, I'd arranged to go to take a group of students to a charity bike ride from John O'Groats to Land's End. Um, so these guys were doing the massage for the riders. It was like 800 riders reliant upon these 10 students for their massage at the end of each day. And I had stupidly, before my back went, I'd also volunteered to ride the event, as well as supervise the students, as well as work in the massage tent from two o'clock in the afternoon till 10 in the evening. And I couldn't let people down because I'm a people pleaser. And um, so I got on the coach up to John O'Groats, got to John O'Groats, it was snowing. This is in June. It was snowing. Walked out of the coach. We were in tents. Oh, this couldn't get any fucking worse. Pulled my bike off the coach. The first day, we rode 99 miles around sort of north, and Sco north Scotland, which you can imagine is a bit like that. And I spent most of those 99 miles out of the saddle because I couldn't sit down because my leg pain was so bad. Um, got, home, got back to camp, next camp. Work from two till 10 in the massage tent with the students. And if you know what students are like, they're lazy little bastards on the, at the best of times. They'd do a couple of massages and then I'd be left to sort of pick up the pieces. Day two was 130 miles when I rode that out of the saddle pretty much. And that was around the Cairngorms. So again, very mountainous. Um, massage tent from two till 10. There was a point to this story, just stick with me. <laughs> and then day three, I woke up on day three and my intractable sciatica, which was like, you know, 10 out of 10 intolerable pain. You know, I, was I took tramadol, I took some pregabalin, I've done some really strong painkillers and central nervous system suppressants. It had gone. Never to come back. I rode all the way down to, uh, to Land's End, and I was in the chair from, the vet that, from that day. And to this day, never had touch wood, never had another problem with my back. So even in those situations, I'll tell you this story, because even in those situations where people have had, you know, intolerable back pain and sciatica for a long period of time, if you're patient, it will go. It does heal. It's, a, it's um, disc prolapses, the middle bit of your disc, which is called the nucleus pulposus, has never been exposed to your immune system. That's what they call immune discreet. Now, when you prolapse a disc, which is when the middle bit squeezes out, it usually comes out in a posterolateral direction, which pushes onto the nerve roots. And that's what gives you the sciatica. So it's the pressure from the nucleus pulposus from the squidgy bit in the middle of the disc. Now, once that comes into contact with your blood, the uh, immune system basically goes, this is a foreign body, this is non-self, and it starts to embark upon an immune response. So if you can tolerate the, the, you know, the leg symptoms and the sciatica, eventually your immune system will nibble away at that prolapse and get take the pressure off your nerve and it will recover. I think the problem is with a lot of clients is it's impatience. You know, they don't understand that these things can take two or three months for the immune system to deal with them. That's if they've got a healthy immune system. You know, if you're dealing with people that are overweight, they produce, so adipose tissue produces lots of cytokines. Cytokines are pro-inflammatory. They produce lots of systemic inflammation. So you've, in an overweight client, you've got a fairly unhealthy immune system. And that's typically why these things don't take longer to heal in that sort of population group. Mm. So why do I think that got better? Well, if you think about what we do when we floss the sciatic nerve, you will know what I mean by flossing. Have you seen those weird videos where like, you're sitting on a chair and you straighten your leg and you bend your leg and your head goes back as your leg straightens? Yeah, so that's flossing. Now, I think cycling is like flossing. So essentially, what was I doing every day? I spent 99 miles on day one flossing my hamstring or flossing my sciatic nerve. I spent 130 miles on day two flossing my sciatic nerve. So by day three, any adhesions between the nerve and the sheath had been broken down, and now my nerve was moving normally, hence my leg pain went. Now, it's unusual. I'm, I'm not saying this is what you're going to find in every situation. Mm -hmm. In my experience with working with, you know, hundreds, if not thousands of people with disc prolapses, doing some, getting them on, so, as soon as you can get them into that position where you're like they're sitting on, able to sit on a bike, 
getting them to use the bike as a technique to try and floss the hamstring or floss the sciatic nerve. That works really, really well. So that's top tip number one for you. Are you right to just unshare the screen one second? Man? So just want, oh, yeah, I, just want to, I just want to clarify, just so everybody knows, and you've said it officially so they can quote you. If somebody has sciatic nerve pain, all they have to do is cycle from John O'Groats to Land's End and that gets rid of it. It gets rid of it. Thank you. Just so you can put a direct quote on Instagram that I <laughs> the official diagnosis for fixing that is that. I mean, yeah, I think, they, I think it, you could look at it many ways, couldn't you? You could look at it like I was in a situation where it was almost like you do this, you know, in a, in a, in a grandiose sense or you die. Maybe somehow we trip the central nervous system into things. Pains are, pains are, like we've talked about before, what we should talk about in some point in the future, Chris, is pain. That, that would be a really good podcast. Yeah. Yeah. Pain's complex. And there's loads of things that feed into your perception of pain. Now, if you're in a situation where essentially your brain's thinking, well, if I don't do this, you know, I'm, I'm stranded hundreds of miles from home with no way to get back, it's like, do or die, and maybe there was a sense of that involved in it. But yeah, I think the, the repetitive circular action of the of your leg on the pedals, mm. I think is what probably unstuck my stuck nerve. Hundred percent. And I um, I just grabbed this while you were talking because everybody um, just so, if, so you can explain it is that unfortunately we don't have a um, any um, lumbar vertebrae coming out here, but the thing about the um, the nerves and <laughs> we talked about craniosacral before the sacrum is a very very important bone but what you'll find with a lot of people if you work with trained individuals uh, as in like people who are very strong is that when we go into a deadlift position if i just go from this angle here we want to promote this so anterior tilt we need that to get into a safe hinge position so think about anterior tilt and going this way so that's what we want to go for. Now, Aaron, uh, how much were you uh, deadlifting? Do you mind me asking when you back? Um, I was up to about two hundred kilos. Right. So yeah. So that's that's that is the despite what you think that's super physiological weights because yeah. it, it, that um, you know when we talk about these elite power lifters and people who are lifting um, you know the three four hundred kilos, that's very 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 far down the line. But on the human body, anything over probably body weight is super physiological. And that's from, a, from an evolutionary perspective, um, which is that's completely plucked out of my ass. That's not official or anything, but it, that as soon as you go in over probably body weight, double body weight, then you're into that realm. So yeah, I was about I was about eighty kilos at that point. So it was yeah, uh, two point five. Uh, two point five. So we got. So what's happening here is that when we, when he's going into this position here, like so, whenever we um, glide the pelvis backwards, if we think about the the lumbar vertebra, we're going to have a natural lordosis. And people got to remember about neutral spine and good posture is that you need, your spinal curves are important. And in some people to be more pronounced than others. And that's just, again, genetics and the way they're built. Um, now, people who are better at deadlift probably have, do have more an exaggerated lordosis. And that's why they can actually deadlift so much. So if we're thinking about it going this way, but for whatever reason, maybe it was just a muscle was inhibited or he was tired or he was working a long day. When Aaron lifted that day, he probably went into a little bit more anterior tilt than his body could tolerate, which has then caused a spasm in the nerve root compression, which is causing this crazy amount of, well, it's product disc, so he obviously did, it did pretty damage it. So we think about, if you can now envision, if I look here, there's a spine going this way in the, in the lordosis. And because something's, obviously the disc has slipped, it's now getting that posterior root compression. So it's compressing like um, the disc is getting, even though the lumbar, lumbar vertebra are shaped like that, it's now going even more, which is causing this nerve root compression around, was it L3, L4? It was L5. L5, right. so it was, yeah. It was the disc in between L5 and this one. All right, okay. So we've got so this compression around here. Now it's actually, dare I say, very, very simple to me. I've, never, I've not heard that story before about the cycling, but the reason why that makes sense to me is because cycling is a counter-nutated sacrum position. So you, you, especially in the seat, it is, it's, it's um, femurs pointing that way, very, very rounded um, lumbar spine. You're taking yourself out of, um, 
out of lordosis and into a more of a straight. And that probably created so much traction and strength that's constantly going on that his body just got so used to that position and had to compensate the other way and that balanced everything out. So this is the management of lower back systems. And the reason why this is important is because if you're working with a guy who is overweight, who has a lot, has a big belly and exists in this um, anterior pelvic position and he gets to squat, his lower back's going to pull and it probably does that thing where he crosses his leg over the other side and he's trying to stretch it out and you're like, um, okay, I'll reverse band it and it doesn't work. And there's, there's loads of things on that nature. This is your bread and butter as a client. Um, and you can tell them to slow it down. You can tell them to do whatever. But what's happening is because there's so much riding through the pelvis and it's changing position so much, the lumbar vertebrae are going to get pumped up. That's going to compress that nerves that, that, and then you might get sciatic pain, etc. What you actually want to think about is repositioning the pelvis so he's in a more counter-nutated sacrum position. So this sacrum is going underneath. That'll open up the junction, free up the nerves, and that's when you can simultaneously train someone whilst also getting the nerve flossing as well. So you can actually use exercise to get rid of the uh, lower back pain. And that's the most potent thing. You don't want fucking bird dogs and, and um, dead bugs because they're great, absolutely amazing, but they're not going to impact someone with muscle tissue and a very um, highly trained central nervous system. Because you've got to think about what it is in proportion. So this is where understanding like the sciatic forum in here to these holes and how there's a lumbar plexus up here and where everything goes we want to create space and get expansion around those muscles so we can get a better firing signal to all the muscles down there so again it's it's a very strange one why they never touch on um neurology and um, nerve anatomy but it's a big thing um are you have to just pop up the brachial plexus please buddy yeah of course i am i was just going to add on to that and i'll do that while i'm talking um so in, in the people I see who get disc injuries, they typically are people that who, it's, it's when your back changes position under load. So as long as you can maintain your back in a neutral spine position or, you know, in a slightly extended position whilst you're lifting, generally that, that protects your discs. It's when you get into that position where, you know, at the bottom of your squat or at the bottom of your deadlift, you suddenly get a reversal in the lumbar lordosis and it's that change that tends to compromise your disc that's usually the mechanism that people describe although they won't necessarily describe it like that in those technical terms but that's what's happening so with those clients that chris was talking about you know who are already overweight and are very hyper lordotic reducing the range of movements so that you're not allowing them to go into the range where that lumbar spine reverses is one of the best ways to stop them from getting these sort of episodic periods of back pain and then, you know, worst case scenario, prolapse in a disc. And I think the other point I'd take on what Chris was saying is this analogy of core stability. The worst thing you can do for, you, for someone with sciatica, you know, nerve root compression, is train their core. Because what you tend to find is you raise, in, raise intra-abdominal pressure, you actually start to raise intradiscal pressure. And more intradiscal pressure pushes that prolapse more onto the nerve. So it's one of the, the kind of the most painful things you can imagine. You're bearing down, trying to contract your transverse abdominus and do whatever it is that you're trying to do. You're doing your sort of dead bugs. Um, and that actually exacerbates their leg symptoms, not because of the position they're in, but because inside your intra-abdominal pressure increase is actually increasing intradiscal pressure. So stay clear of core cycle from John O'Groats Land's end. Yeah, just do that he said. The, um, what, you, what you need to, um, need to do, and bearing in mind that, with all due respect to everyone on the call, apart from Aaron, is that if someone has very, very bad you know, disc bulges, they should be seeing a, um, a specialist before coming to the gym floor. But what we're looking to do with exercise is that, yes, we have core exercises. We're looking to change the shape of the spine into reversing the structure. So it is opening where it is usually closed. And we've now got a reverse of that. So for somebody who naturally has a very high lordosis, you would want to what's called counter take the sacrum so their knees are up in front of them. And then you would want to try and create some version of stability. If you were to do a prone, so that's hands down, the chest facing the floor, dead bug with somebody with a lower back posterior compression on the nerve root, that's going to pop them up. That's going to really hurt. And that's especially if they've got heavy legs and big glutes. 
And this is understand the anatomy. It is, it is simple on, on thought, but then you've got to think about on the gym floor. Now, I know that might be scary, like I don't want to hurt anybody, but again, if somebody's got a um, nerve root compression and prolasticity, they should be working with maybe somebody else and then they get passed on to you once that's been managed. However, yeah. if you're really smart in your application and understand what's in front of you, you then can start to change things. And I must add that this is something to consider as well. It's, some people have very high kyphosis and low doses. Some people, it's the other way around. They have reduced low doses and kyphosis, and that's where the reverse happens. So you need to put them in the opposite position. So this is where uh, context is key, but understanding the structure of the joints and what you need to do, and that's rehab. Rehab isn't actually learning a load of exercise on a piece of paper. It's looking at what in front of you, looking at the case history and thinking, right, what's most applicable and what can they do? What, you know, what are they able to do right here, right now? So, good. Yeah, I think the majority of it is taking people back to a point where they can move in, the, in a non-aggravating manner. And I think that's... That's what you're doing is you're trying to work out where in that continuum they are. Right, that's where we're starting from. Where do we need to get them back to? And then you've got these steps in between that you have to get to do that. Right, shall I share this screen? Yes, please. Right, so we now have the brachial plexus, which is the nerve supply to your upper limb. Now... I think there, there's several points on here that are really interesting. So like we talked about with the with cordial equina syndrome in the lumbar spine, in the sort of neck upper part of your shoulder, there's a few what we call pinch points or mechanical interfaces where you can start to get compression on the brachial plexus. So you get your nerve roots that come out of the C5 down to T1, uh, vertebral levels, that's the nerve roots that make up the brachial plexus. They then come through the anterior and middle scalene. So they dive between the two scalenes. They dive between the clavicle and the first rib. So this is another pinch point, another place where you can start to get compression. And then they run through what they call the clavi pectoral fascia, which is basically the skin and the fascia that overlies the front of your chest, the front of your shoulder. Now, people, if you're in a very protracted, kind of round-shouldered, forward head position, all those pinch points are basically tight and able to compromise that, those, that nerve bundle as it emanates from the spine. And that's called thoracic outlet syndrome. There is a, a named syndrome called after this. And it will be compression of the, the kind of brachial plexus, not an individual nerve, but compression of the brachial plexus as it passes either between the scalenes, between the clavicle and the first rib, or between or through the clavipectoral fascia. So from a, you know, when you're looking at posture, and I think there's lots of de debate about is posture, is there a good or bad posture? Well, from a nerve perspective, there definitely is a good posture, and that's where your shoulders are retracted, your head's in a good alignment with the rest of your spine. Because what you're doing then is you're taking all the pressure off that nerve bundle as it passes through into the arm. And this is another reason why, again, I think direct work. I had a guy come in to me who'd had some deep tissue work done um, into his, well, he described it as his trap, um, but it was actually more anterior neck, more scalenes. And the massage therapist had worked so hard through there that he would left there in a lot of pain and then he'd lost the use of his arm, completely lost the use of his arm when he came to see me. So he walked in with this slight limp thing that he sort of swam around, which was essentially a neuropraxia, which is a transient compression of the nerve. So there's various types of nerve, in, nerve injuries. When you compress a nerve, it's called a neuropraxia. Once you remove that compression, the nerve will then start to fire again and, and regenerate itself. But Clearly, the pressure that this practitioner had used was enough to actually damage some of the nerve roots that controlled. It was abduction movements. He got flexion and extension. He couldn't control abduction. So it was probably the axillary nerve, which is the, most, the, the nerve that supplies the delts and the teres minor muscle. Now, once you've gone through the clavipectoral fascia, the, the arm is less well-defined than the leg. So in the leg, you've got compartments that are supplied by various parts of those nerves we talked about. 
But in the arm, it's a bit of a mishmash. This is why we leave this till the second semester when we're teaching anatomy to the students. We teach the lower limb first because it's easy and it's compartmentalised, whereas the upper limb doesn't really follow any patterns. But essentially, you've got a few nerves now that you probably want to make a note of. So you've got the musculocutaneous nerve. And that comes from the C5, C6 nerve roots. And that supplies BBC. And that's not a big black cock. <laughs> that's biceps brachii, brachialis, and coracobrachialis. So it's three muscles that are supplied by the musculocutaneous nerve. We then go down into, so we also we talked about the axillary nerve, which is what controls um, your deltoid and your teres minor muscle. And then we come into the forearm, and this is probably the thing that you're gonna see lots and lots of. This is certainly when I was PT, and this is certainly the stuff that I saw a lot more of than I did musculocutaneous problems or axillary nerve problems. So the nerve that supplies pretty much the flexors of your forearm, the flex the thumb and those two fingers there, that's the median nerve. So the median nerve. Now, the thing with nerves in the upper limb, they supply a certain group of muscles, but they also supply the sensation to certain parts of your hand or certain parts of your arm. So the way to work out, I'm just trying to get myself in, the way to work out if someone's got a median nerve compression is they'll have altered sensation into the thumb, that finger, that finger, and half of that finger. So I think carpal tunnel syndrome, which is compression of the nerve, underneath the flexor retinaculum, which is a bit in the front of your wrist. So if someone comes in complaining of tingling into thumb and the first three, two and a half fingers, that's a median nerve distribution. Now, you could, if this isn't coming from, there's various places again that this could get compressed, but the median nerves goes through the pronator teres muscle, which Chris was talking about last week. So pronator teres is at the elbow, on the, on the sort of the inside of the elbow here. So tight forearms can start to cause problems with nerve compression, certainly in the upper limb. So it's well within your remit as a PT to maybe give your clients some foam rolling, some stuff to do for their forearms as a first uh, kind of first aid step in trying to address some of that sort of those neurological issues you've got. The other nerve on the other side is the ulnar nerve, U-L-N-A, so the ulnar nerve. Now the ulnar nerve supplies the other side of your forearm and the other side of your hand. So from the middle, your ring finger, half of the ring finger to your little finger, that's supplied by the ulnar nerve. Now on the back of the hand, so we have another nerve, and this is called the radial nerve. Now, if anybody's ever had a mid-shaft fracture of the humerus, you often get radial nerve damage with that because the radial nerve runs in something called the spiral groove, which is on the back of the humerus. So you fracture your humerus, you also damage the radial nerve, and then you lose the radial nerve controls muscles that extend the elbow, muscles that extend the wrist, and muscles that extend the fingers. So you can imagine if you've damaged the radial nerve, you can't extend your elbow, wrist, or fingers. So it's, it's pretty catastrophic. Now, from a, nurse, a sensory supply perspective, do you know what I mean by the anatomical snuff box? Does anybody know what I mean? Shake your head or nod your head now. So if you, if you do, let me get my hand into position. Hard to get round there. All right, that's, there we are. So this region here, if you open your thumb, separate your thumb from your fingers, you'll see you've got like a little depression at the base of the thumb. Now, back in the days where they used to snort snuff, that's what they used to put the snuff on to have a little bit of hit of, I think it's tobacco, isn't it, snuff? I'm not sure what, I, I, I don't partake in snuff, it's an old school thing. 
So it's called the anatomical snuff box. And the anatomical snuff box, the, the muscles that, support, that sit around that region there, that's where the radial nerve supplies in terms of sensation. So I'm not suggesting that, you know, you're now going to go out and start treating people with nerve injuries, but being in a position where you can recognize that and then know when to refer onto your local friendly osteopath or sports therapist or physiotherapist will elevate. When you go in and say, I think they've got some sort of radial nerve compression or median nerve compression or a, that starts to develop relationships with those people. They think, okay, this guy or girl knows what he's talking about. He understands a little bit of neurology. And you then start to create a working relationship between the two of you. And as Chris and I have talked about on numerous podcasts in the past, I think personally cultivating relationships, you know, to and fro relationships with your therapists and your PTs is one of the best ways to support your clients effectively. Because there's stuff that you guys do better than, than I do, than, than therapists do, and there's stuff that we do that's probably outside of your remit as a, as a PT. But when we work cohesively together, the, 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 the winner there is, is the client. You know, your client gets better management, better overall results because they can be consistent with the training. There's workarounds. You know, you find somebody that doesn't tell you to rest every time you've got an injury, which is the sign of a bad therapist. And you know everyone's a winner. That's your brachial plexus. Sweet. Yeah. That off? That's perfect. Yeah, I'll stop that. So the um, so where do you think right? Okay, where does that come in? Well, you get a guy who comes in, and um, it's a brilliant picture. There's a very very good image that because what you the main thing is is that it's not there is a kind of a mirror image. The way I see it is that like radial is more sciatic, but it's not as bulky and just a bit of a tangent but what I think is really cool is when you look at embryology is that the groupings of nerves indicate what needs to be what needs to fire synergistically so then we, when we look at extensors of the forearm and finger extensors and then we look at the triceps which are both innervated by the radial nervous like, well maybe there's some sort of relationship between the triceps and that and then when we look at fascia and when we look at like arm lines and everything the, you can really start to see where there's connections in what the brain's trying to do so what muscles need to, to to fire in synergy to create some form of um some form of kind of either stability or movement and um, so if we have a guy who comes in like this and this is very very common it can be females as well or you have a female who's carried a baby like this and she's she's got a very compre you know, very very compressed uh, and contracted right bicep Yes, we have a right bicep um, that's tight. Yes, it needs to be strengthened and lengthened and everything. But there's also compression and possibly hypertrophy and, and um, some type of obstruction between all these anterior compartments. Now, one thing that I think is, is really important to consider as well when we talk about diaphragmatic breathing, so breathing is so important because of yeah, this, this, and this. But some people, and you might even find it in yourself, scalenes are absolutely like granite. And then if we look at the scalenes in um, the scalenes insertion and origin point and where they're going into around the first rib, if they're locked up and they don't move, we have then compression around all the anterior nerves that come through here, that go through the clavicle down through this junction here, like so. So you get a guy who goes, yeah, I want to come in and I want to bench my, and I want to improve the top of my chest. Well, he's got his medial and lateral pectineal nerve, which are coming through this junction here. So around the coracoid process, that doesn't have, if that can't open up and they can't get the right amount of stimulus to it, he's not going to be contracting much in his chest. I mean, you know, you can hook him up to EMGs, that's never going to happen. But really from a logical perspective is you need to promote this as well as this. So the exercise I did the other day, um, on, on Instagram where it's rotating out and, and breathing in and inhaling and opening it as you could think about if you think about all these nerves median especially muscular cutaneous is that by going like this opening up the shoulder and rotating going into extension of the wrist that's a flossing motion for that if I can synchronize it with the breathing and inhale and open it then we've got a two-way system of flossing the nerve improving thoracic extension and so forth so I don't need to put that in the post. That's a little bit too complex, but these are the things that people can be doing and should be doing in between what's going to counteract it. So yes, it is good from a stretching perspective, but stretching, so nerve is, um, is a quicker route. When you were with people like Aaron and, and I'm not there yet, you generally as a, as a, as a, um, a therapist, 
get lazier in the fact that you want to find the things that work quicker. And that's not a, that, that's like, if I can find something that improves the nerve gliding, which is going to have a massive impact on the function of the muscle, I'd rather do that than fucking rub someone for an hour because that's just boring. So it's like, how do I get, um, how do I get there quicker? He's laughing now. <laughs> so, so, right, so it's... Uh, I was just waving at my daughter. She's just in the paddling pool. I'm oh, sorry. I didn't mean to swear. Don't worry. <laughs> Um, right, so we have got, um, sorry about that. I think just on your point there, Chris, sorry to interrupt. Um, so individuals who've got asthma, so the, the breathing is, I mean, this is probably another, another podcast we could talk about. Um, breathing is, there's three different types of breathing. You've got apical, lateral thoracic, and diaphragmatic. And we all know we should be breathing diaphragmatically. Um, however, asthmatics, people are highly stressed, they tend to apically breathe. So as Chris was saying, their scalenes are usually like they're solid. And I think just changing the way that they're breathing, so not necessarily intervening in terms of you know, any deep tissue work into those muscles at the front, but just getting them to think about their breathing patterns over time will take away some of that hypertonicity in the muscle. So you don't even need to do any hands-on stuff to change this stuff. It's actually behavioral changes that, that you need. Get them to change their breathing patterns. Like very much like we talked about with the feet. I think it was last week, that active foot position. These are habitual things. These are things that need to be ingrained into the nervous system. So they've learned to breathe, you know, with, incorrectly. They've, they've learned to breathe using their accessory muscles of respiration. That's now causing symptoms into the arm. Again, like Chris said, rather than thinking, right, I need to send them to my local neighborhood massage therapist to get some loosening off, because that, that's a quick fix, but it's not a permanent fix. If you change breathing patterns, you change that permanently. And I think that's a, the better, that's a better outcome for everybody. Mm. Um, yeah, perfect. So we'll go with, um, it's only taken now, but we'll go with the Q&A, the extended Q&A, which just got to. Um, so guys, you can either unmute yourself, or if you feel, if you want to just type it in the, um, in the chat, just absolutely anything. You can go any body part, whether it's yourself, client. Um, you can't see anyone. And then we'll, uh, Aaron will just, Aaron and I will just make small talk on, amongst ourselves whilst you're typing. I, I think what what I've noticed from this session, and I hope everybody else is ev it's, it's evident to everybody else. So Chris has been talking for the last few weeks about you know the muscles of the upper limb, the muscles of the lower limb. Well, the neurology is thing, the thing that brings all of that together. And I think it's the missing piece of the jigsaw puzzle. And I think, I don't understand why, you know, maybe we need to petition those people that run courses to include some basic neurology. Because I think when you understand, you know, nerve supplies, not necessarily, you know, the in-depth stuff, but just some basic fundamentals of neurology, you start to understand movement better. You start to understand muscle activation better kind of brings everything together. So it's almost like this is the amalgamation of, how long we've been going now, seven weeks, eight weeks, yeah. six weeks. Um, this is the amalgamation of the last six weeks worth of, you know, anatomy club. And this is what brings all of that stuff together. And the, it just, it makes so much sense um, in regards to, um, you know, how, how we move when you look at what nerves innovate, what, um, and that's that's thing. And I think the I'll 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 put it up somewhere. I'm not going to say where because I just need to think of. But the, the if you can remember Amaryllis fogs, you pretty much got the peripherals. So Amaryllis is going to be. I was going to try and do that bit from Ted. We know where he does all the girls' names, but I'm not going to do that. <laughs> <laughs> so it's the so Amaryllis is going to be accessory, uh, musculocutaneous, median, um, auxiliary radial, lateral, um, pectineal, and we've got ulna, it's the S, the, is it? help me out here Aaron, S, S is the obvious one, median. Are we Are talking brachial, brachial plexus here? I've not heard of brachial. this. I've not, I, I made it up, I've got it somewhere, right. anyway, remembering it. And then, I'm, I've said it's amaryllis, so there's, where's the S in the um, brachial plexus? Sure, uh, being recorded now, don't let me down. It's probably the subscapular nerve. That's the one. Thank you, subscapular. Yeah. So I'll, I'll put the uh, I'll put the whatever it's called memnomic up. Fogs is just femoral obturator, uh, gluteal, and um, sciatic, Branchy. and they have branches. 
So that's just the base, and then they go off into branches. So you've got inferior, inferior, superior of the gluteal. Um, you have got uh, the op obturator branch. No, does the, op the obturator branch off? But sciatic then goes into the tibial and then the um, superficial. Common peroneal. Common peroneal. Yeah. I don't yeah. think the, the obturator and the femoral don't. Was this femoral? I don't have the branches. But anyway, I'll put that somewhere. And even though that might think like it's a nicety, remember that if you're on this call, if you've been coming to all these, it's because you want to really excel and get further on. Knowing this, just honestly, just you know, the more you do it, the easier it gets. It does help. And the thing is, when we do eventually get to the questions, unfortunately, the, the, some physiotherapists, not physios, but like physios, osteos, chiros, so you need to say we're personal trainer, they'll roll their eyes and go, oh God, you know, here we go. But the second you email, the second you can say, I have a client who has suspected uh, medial, uh, nerve root, uh, well, medial nerve compression due to internally rotated shoulders and an excessive amount of tension or hypothesis in the bicep, and you email that to him, please could you work on X, Y, Z, and then give me a report of what you've done. That changes everything. And that guy will go, or that guy or girl will go, I'm going to send my clients to this guy. And then you build relationships, you don't have to faff around, like faff around with uh, Instagram to try and get clients. You just do it through an internal network. So this is where this stuff becomes very, very useful. And it just takes a little bit of investment into it. You know, you put something together in an official email and then send that to a health practitioner. And I, I think I put it in the book and it's like, getting a network of health of um, treatment therapists underneath you, your wing is absolute gold as a business model. Yeah. They'll, they'll always see three or four times the amount of people, if not more than you will as a busy PT. They'll always see, they'll always, always see more people than you and on a higher frequency. So Aaron, off the top of your head, how many clients you got on your books? Oh, over a thousand, I think active clients. There you go. So I don't see all those in one go, obviously, but yeah. Is that <laughs> in a day. Did it in a day. Probably in a day, I'll see 14 to 16 clients in a day. So, um, so yes. Yeah, so yeah. I, and I think this is what we've talked about this a lot, Chris. Hmm. I think I work down at S20 Physique in Sheffield. Um, and I have some really good relationships with Matt Seaman down there, Drew, um, Nathan Styles. So all the PTs down there, it's a very collaborative relationship. And once I've done my stuff, I'm more than happy because I know those guys really well. You know, they've, we've, we've spoken at length. So I've got a good understanding of what their strengths and weaknesses are. And as soon as I've done my clinical bits, I'm referring those guys back into... And then equally, you know, I see a client and they're looking for PTs or I need some rehab and then I'm referring people backwards and forwards. So it's a two-way street. I think the only thing I'd say in relation to what Chris said about, yes, send your email, but probably best to say your opinion would be appreciated regarding whatever it is rather than saying, can you work on this? Oh, yeah. there's, uh, there's a lot of ego in therapy. I have no ego, so you could write that to me and I'd be like, oh, okay, then. But I know a lot of physios, you wrote to a physio saying, can you work on this? They'd be like, who the fuck are you telling me to have to work on? You're just a PT. Well, because I, I, I not knowing my names because I didn't know who it was, but I lost an online client um, who just never got back to me once because he uh, ruptures his Achilles. Um, and I wanted him to do um, a lot of high rep calf work with very, very light weight and do some form of eccentrics holding onto a TRX onto a box. And he wanted to train hard. And I think he, was, he says, it's all right. I don't need the rehab stuff. I'm seeing a physio. His physio wanted him to rehab it by doing box jumps. So, yeah. 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 And I think that's, you know, don't think for one minute, and this is not a rant against any profession. I teach on a physio degree and um, they do 12 weeks of like rehab type stuff bear in mind physios have to do lots of different stuff you know it's neuro it's respiratory it's not just msk stuff now of that 12 weeks it's probably three hours where they're actually in the gym doing kind of like exercise prescription stuff so don't think for one minute that that you are subservient to your physiotherapy counterparts because actually i think in many respects you are much more qualified in exercise prescription than a lot of the guys are Osteopaths, and Chris will tell me, tell me different now, but when I did my osteopathic degree, the, the rehab education was based on 
what your clinic tutor had used with his clients beforehand. Uh, there was no formal um, rehab education in osteopathy. So typically osteopaths, it's manual therapy based, they treat you and then they, you go until you come back and see them the next time. So osteopaths are a really good um, bunch of people to start to tap into because they don't do, generally don't do exercise prescription. You know, my background, I was a PT on the Air Force, so I came from an exercise prescription background before I did my degree. So I already had that box ticked. But the majority of osteopaths, is this the same as it is now, Chris? You don't really, there's nothing. Two days in yeah. four years. Yeah, there's very little exercise prescription on there. So all you'll get from your osteopath is, I'm trying to think of a really, probably some banded external rotation for your rotator cuff. That's probably the sum total of what they'll know. And that's based on who their clinic tutor was when they were training. Mm -hmm. So I think there's lots of inroads to make. I'm very, very open to working collaboratively because I think it makes everybody's life better. Yours, your clients, mine, because I'm, I'm having to do hours and hours of rehab with people. Cool. Right, so application of flossing. Is there a best time frequency to recommend to a client or is it highly individual? Um, it's compliancy, just the same thing. It's just like, you know, are they going to do it? Are they, um, you know, uh, if you give him a time like, say, right, I want you to do this for 10 minutes in the morning and we've got three kids that can you and we've got to get the kids to school and then get to the office and I'm going to do it. Before bed, I like with nerve flossing because getting somebody lay on the back with their feet up against the wall apparently is a parasympathetic um, stimulator. You know, that's done in a lot of practices. Um, just to, in terms of the frequency, it just needs to be um, as regularly as, as manageable, really. I, I like to do, which I've not done now, but you do it, if somebody is working at home now, a timer and that one where you say, you're just doing that thoracic extension and just doing 10 breaths, getting around, rotate your neck, get them to walk about, especially now in this current climate, um, just whatever they can do. Um, so it's just like anything with calories and fat loss is just a, what's the, what's the likely, most likelihood of being of them being compliant from an actual structural or, or um, benefit perspective. Aaron will probably a lot, know a lot more. So, yeah, I think um, frequency is important. You have to do it. It's little and often. <clears throat> I tend. I think I talked about this last week. I have a. I hate. I'm, I'm the least organised person you will ever know. So I my PDR with my boss, my university boss yesterday he said great in front of students but your admin's absolutely dog shit however i like you know those little dots you can get when you organize your files i get clients to buy a pack of those dots and put them in places where they go frequently so the kitchens make a cup of tea put one on the door of the, of the cupboard so you take your cup out brushing your teeth morning and night so put some dots around the house every time you see a dot you stay there for 10 seconds and you do your floss or you do whatever it is that you're trying to do. So I think there isn't a, an exact prescription, but it does seem to be the more you're doing it, the better the, the results will be. And I think short bouts, periodically through the day, rather than setting aside 10 minutes in the morning where you do all your exercises and then you don't think about it again for the rest of the day is much better. Um, so yeah, I use, I use dots around the house. Enough to cool. Uh, two things Aldoa and um, so first of all, to touch on Aldoa, um, I've not I've not come across it. I've from the people who I know have done it, it it's fantastic. Um, but it, it I think and I don't know that it's working on the principle of spinal alignment plus nerve glossing, and that, that looks what it looks that's what it looks like to me because there is a lot of um, yeah, supination um, uh, wrist extension which is by, as a byproduct, going to open up that, that junction. Yeah. Um, so i definitely say, Aaron, do you want, you've done Aldoa, haven't you? Yeah, so if you've not seen Aldoa, there's a couple of Aldoas on our feed. I've put a spinal decompression on an L5-S1. Um, I think we did a hip flexor Aldoa. But yeah, it's um, whatever you think of fascia and fascial trains and nerve tension, essentially Aldoa, encompasses all of those things into one stretch so you're tight you're winding up the nervous system because of that wrist extension and then like the thing chris was talking about with his wrist extension and um, elbow extension wrist arch shoulder retraction um, so there's a lot of neural tension there's a lot of fascial tension and then obviously you have to learn to breathe through that tension and i think that's where the aldoa stuff works works well 
but it's just another it's another technique you know i think there's uh there's a million ways that we can uh influence the fascia influence the nervous system but i think it's useful i yeah. think although will be too aggressive for somebody with uh, an acute disc or an acute injury so i think it's it's time and place you'd have to choose time choose your place and choose your client um effectively but yeah I, I like outdoor stuff i think it's quite useful and like I say, it's just choose the application for like yeah. certain clients. It would be amazing. Again, if you've got high type A, always on the go clients, very, very high octane, very stressful life. If you say to them, right, I want you to diaphragmatic and move for five minutes, you're going to look at you and be like, no. So it's, it, it, again, it, in terms of, um, you know, it, it's person specific. The uh, relationship between the jaw and diaphragmatic breathing would having an over underbite have an effect on posture too. <gasps> oh, okay. So, what this was the this was this was the uh, the conversation I was having that I thought it was Jack I was having with. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So we've got. So, ooh, this is a, this is a, probably a, a podcast or like one of them we can go into. But if we're looking at the the position of the jaw, so we've got our masseter and pterygoids, which are just cheek muscles here, and. Um, it, I don't know. How, I don't know where to go with this one. So, so uh, I don't want to use stuff that you might might go over your head in regards to muscles and what matters. But yes, there is. So, just to answer your question, yes, there's definitely. In my opinion, there's definitely going to be that because of the compensations and the accessory muscles that have to work harder when you um, when you when you're not diaphragmatic breathing, which is probably a lot yeah. of the easier way. So, just to summarise. There's, there's um, episode number 100 that I did was with a posturologist uh, who's an osteopath called Annette Verpalot. She was speaking about this type of thing and there is a lot going on with the jaw. However, that would be going into stuff which is way, way, way beyond my scope, um, which is going to look at probably vestibular system and your perceptions, which are going into a lot of different brain regions. So we have like the MSK anatomy and everything that's easy to understand. And then we have the... 10 years of studying very, very complex topics to understand the neurology from what's going on in the brain centers and how different things can impact us um, down that route. So we're not going to go there because I don't understand that. But the, in regards to the biomechanics, um, lack of diaphragmatic breathing is going to ex um, impact accessory muscles, SCM, sternocleidomastoid and also um, scalenes, that's going to impact the way the jaw is going to move because there might be some restrictions uh, in that as well. A big one is like is looking at different regions which have intersections. We've got the mastoid process and we've got the sternocleidomastoid, we've got a masseter. They're all in junctions around here. If there is a length tension different in this SCM and that SCM and this scalene and, and that scalene, um, what we're going to have is a slight twist of the head or slight can, the change in the position of the, uh, the skull. Um, and that itself will impact the way the, the way the jaw is. Um, just anecdotally for myself, I have a much higher level of compression in this uh, right side here, in, the, in TMJ here. That just feels like really gun junk, like just gunky and um, tight. And I also have right SI joint recurring issues. So there's something in it, in my opinion. Um, mm. So yeah, Aaron, do you wanna? Yeah, no, I think I think very much the same. I think you've got to remember, your your head and neck because of the um, because they contain the special senses they're very sensitive to changes in position so there's something called the frankfurt horizontal which is basically the alignment of the special senses so your you know your sense of balance taste smell all those things they only work when the head's aligned when you're off slightly off kilter you start to get changes in balance, changes in posture, changes in taste perception, changes in smell, changes in hearing. Um, so yeah, the jaw plays a big part in, um, I think it's more posture plays a big part on the jaw as opposed to the jaw plays a big part on posture. I think it's the, the case of the chicken and the egg. So I think posture, you know, we typically see those people with forward head postures, started to also experience TMJ problems, totemporal mandibular problems, and then they start to knock into the neck and then it starts to knock into, you know, the other those special senses we were talking about. So yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a complex subject area. And what I'd say, remember is your jaw float, your jaw's floating. Yeah. So 
um, if you if you go into more kyphosis, you're going to get an underbite. If you go into if you as the more you retract your head, you'll actually go that. And I've done do what I, what I can find with people who have TMJ pain. What I'd go from a biomechanical spe- uh, perspective is more a uh, little bit more thoracic extension and, and being able to pick the head up. So I would actually work from a training perspective um, with the eye and neck thing that I've got, which looks a bit weird, but I would actually get them to train the extensors and so tuck the chin, bring up and breathe. And if they can diaphragmatically breathe, their jaw would just fall down by default if they can get into that rhythm. So uh, in a- I think if, you're, if you all push your head forwards into that forward head position, it naturally starts to pull your jaw forwards at the same time. I want to see you all doing that on the camera. Come on, Hattie. <laughs> Give me a forward head posture. <laughs> uh, no, okay. Cool. Yeah, so I think to answer your question, Terry, yes, um, the jaw plays a part on posture. And I think, yeah, I think it's perhaps something for outside of the realms of this uh, club, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Because, I'll talk about this. Uh, any advice for helping a client with training who has fibromyalgia and at any given days has pain or weakness in certain areas? So with fibromyalgia, it's, a, it's one of those, uh, I'm really going to regret saying that. It's a little bit like PMS and bear with me because PMS isn't something that you can control whilst it's happening. You have to think about if for those who work with females and obviously females themselves is that it's everything you're doing in the run up to that and join it, which helps. So this is sleep, digestion, um, stress levels, all of these things being managed is going to help the onset. So it's remember, it's a symptom and obviously it's a fibromyalgia is a different symptom of something else. So as unfortunately generic as it sounds is that you really have to stay on top of all those factors to manage it when it does occur, because it can occur at times, which is out of your control in terms of the bouts of it. So you, as, as a really shit answer it is, unfortunately, you've just got to be as healthy as possible and really look after those variables. And then it's a management system and it should get better. If your stress is high, your digestion is poor and your sleep is poor, the bouts of fibromyalgia will probably be a lot more aggressive and a lot uh, more frequent. Um, but again, I think Aaron's, um, Aaron's your man for anything you want to add to that. Um, so fibromyalgia is a diagnosis of exclusion. And what I mean by that is when they don't know what else to call it, they call it fibromyalgia. It's a bit of a dumping ground for the rheumatology departments, which is a shame because I think that means that people, you know, I think it's a bit like um, MS, not multiple, no, ME, sorry, not MS. ME, which was otherwise known as yuppie flu in the 80s, this chronic fatigue syndrome. I think when you're labelled with that, you stop being taken seriously by, you know, the general health practitioners, your GP, the rheumatology department. You're seen as a bit of a time waster in my experience of working with these people. Now, exercise is one of the best ways to get them out of their pain and out of their weakness. So you almost have to spend some time educating them into it's a it's a no it's a pain perception uh, processing problem that causes fibromyalgia and they're not sure what happens and why that happens but essentially they get tender points all over the body so i think there's 13 diagnostic tender points that they use and these guys have 11 of 13 tender points active at any one time so they've got pain above the umbilical region pain below the umbilical region and it like migrates around the body. Now, exercise is great because that starts to dampen down the overactive nervous system. So that becomes an education thing. You have to tell them that they need to be doing that because this is what's going to keep them well. As Chris said, diet, nutrition, sleep, you know, the other sort of side of the, of health and fitness, the stuff that we don't really pay attention to, that's really important. And then I found in my experience working with these guys and girls, that skin brushing, like almost over stimulating the skin, actually helps to dampen down the pain sensation. So I get them to body brush in the shower and not to the point where they're drawing blood, but to body brush to, to the point where they're starting to get an overstimulation of the nervous system, because that's what this essentially boils down to. And then in, by overstimulating, it actually turns the volume down. And over a course of time, those tender points become less tender and less reactive. Um, 
and yeah i think until you get until this becomes you know i i think there's a lot of stuff we need to logically that we don't really we don't really understand very well and i think like i say fibromyalgia is a dumping ground for the rheumatology department um for a, a collection of symptoms that probably fit every other rheumatological condition chronic fatigue pain you know, it's it, you know it's it's not a very it's a bit of a yeah misnomer of a diagnosis um, i i am um, yeah and just, just, uh, i'm glad aaron said it is that I, I think it's very because when i i don't understand what the official kind of diagnosis or prognosis of uh, fibromyalgia is it's i think there's maybe a lot of psychology perhaps that you need to look into um and it might be looking down at certain factors from a psychological aspect of things um which again is maybe a bit pseudoscience so i'm not going to go into too much no i think there's um there's a guy called john sarno s-a-r-n-o john sarno was an orthopedic surgeon that did lots of back surgery and found that his success rate in back surgery was so bad you know it was bad for his e for his ego he stopped doing surgery and he started to intervene with his back patients using uh, some psychological interventions. And on the whole, what he found was a lot of these people experienced chronic pain. And that's not necessarily just fibromyalgia, you know, that's chronic back pain, chronic neck pain, chronic shoulder pain. There's usually either a history of some sort of psychological trauma in the background or they're living a very um, repressed life. And what I mean by that is, you know, when you're driving down the road and somebody pulls out and you're in the car or you pull out on somebody in the car and there's that overblown, massive overreaction where they want to get out of the car and fucking kill you because you've just slowed them down by two seconds. Well, that reaction isn't a normal reaction to what is an innocuous event. That's because this is what Sarno reckons, because essentially you're repressing all those frustrations, those things that happen in your life, we all just push them down. And eventually they reach a point where they're almost like your buckets overflowing. And they think that he thinks that things like fibromyalgia, IBS, that's another common one, these are expressions of the bucket overflowing in an individual, psychologically overflowing in an individual. So I think there's a there's a lot of merits. You know, I'm sure you all take case histories from your clients and I think exploring where they are psychologically, if you're not doing that already, um, might just give you some insights into you know, sleep patterns, behavior patterns, uh, motivation, those sort of things there. One thing that, um, I, I don't know if I've said it in, in podcast myself or what I was saying is that I'm very analytical and they're looking at things from a black and white perspective, but then also looking at the gray. And again, the worst thing that we can think of is like becoming someone's friend or when it, with personal trading where you're overly, um, you know, you, you overstepping the mark with someone and then you have to go into deep logical issues. And sometimes we all feel like more of, um, uh, we feel more like psychiatrists than trainers. But with some certain things, you might just have to say, um, you know, maybe. Aaron, do you have to shoot or have you got time? No, my wife was just telling me that, um, so she's the, she's the oracle of all things rheumatological. Mm. Uh, she was saying that fibromyalgia, there's some research coming out at the moment that suggests this is the early onset of some type of inflammatory arthritis or rheumatoid arthritis, right. which hasn't yet become clinically significant enough that it's picked up in blood tests. So it's almost like the prodrome before you start to develop, you know, RA or some sort of reactive arthritis. So even more reason to keep those people active and get them moving, you know, movement as a, as a central nervous system suppressant. Oops, I don't know if there's a reference for that. I'm not sure. Have you got a reference for that, Dan? No reference doesn't count. If it's not reference, it's not counting. Yeah, exactly. it count. Everything has to be referenced. <laughs> you can probably yeah. find one. I'll, I'll, if we find one, I'll send it over to you, Chris. I need to see the reason. I need to see <laughs> who funded it for the... I need to see the participant size. I need to know the names. Otherwise, I'm not buying yeah, it. Yeah, it was probably the, uh, the fibromyalgia society that, that wanted yeah. to try and create some kudos around there. Cool. So, I know a female late 50s who's really struggling with sciatica. Um, she can't cycle to John O'Groats anytime soon. So, how... <laughs> Um, is there anything manageable? So um, first without the nerve flossing, 
And with nerve flossing, what I really like is imagining your, so the leg is slightly, um, so if you hyperextend the knee and it's really, really locked, then we're more than likely just going to be pulling on the lumbar spine. So what she'll find is if she, as soon as she gets into that hip flex position and bends the knee, then we're going to start to be able to use the tib and fib as the flossing tool. So you'll, everyone will find it, and after this, obviously we've all been sat down for an hour and a half, you lie down on your back, you take your leg up into the single leg, leg raise, you get to that point where you've got your knee slightly unlocked, so I'd say maybe about 45 degrees at the knee, you'll start to get the, the hamstring tension, and then just simply straightening your leg is going to create that uh, traction and, and um, stretching it. Now what, what I like with that is that if we orientate or just direct the femur into internal and external rotation, where it's fighting, where there's resistance, I wouldn't say to her really go into that region, but more encourage her to kind of move her knee. So don't, with the person, I wouldn't go into an external rotation, I'd say move your knee inwards, move your knee outwards and find where there's a bit of resistance, hold it there and then extend the knee and straighten it. And what we want to do is also, if she can coordinate some flexion, um, some dorsiflexion, plantar flexion of the foot at the same time, then we've got that right the way through the entire nerve moving it around. Again, if she can breathe in as she brings her toe towards her knee, breathe out as she um, plantar flexes, that type of thing as well. So now we're getting a, a two-way system with the, um, with the breath. So lying on your back, take your hip leg up, find the tension in the hamstring, taking it up and down, breathing in, breathing out, rotating it through. That's what I'd uh, recommend for the sciatica. Um, because we want the lengthening of the hamstrings and all the muscles around that region but in different ranges, internal, external uh, rotation, uh, maybe at different heights as well. Because there might be just be this actual like really sweet spot, which is what's holding them out of tension. It just needs to be um, surprised open, uh, maybe in a more internally rotated knee position. And that's just going to open it up. That'd be my recommendation. Yeah, I'd, I'd suggest she rides from John O'Groats to Land's End, personally. But, you know, that's, that's just my my take on these things I think, um, managing spinal load so i think if you're if she's in the gym she's a client in the gym i think one of the things the main things i tend to do is lower body wise i take the bottom of any lower body press movement out so if they're squatting might be doing box squats keeping the hips above parallel um, I try and reduce spinal load in full stop, but you know, body weight stuff, they've got to get up and down out of chairs. So essentially you're not adding any more load than they would do when they're sitting on the settee or getting out of the settee, but reduce the range. Um, that'd be the first thing. I think some, and it depends on the movement. So sometimes with discs, they don't like flexion and some discs don't like extension. So you'd find a movement that doesn't aggravate. So with sciatica, there's this phenomenon called centralization and peripherization. Now, when you do a movement, the ideal scenario is when you do that movement, the leg symptoms seem to regress back into the back. When you, that, that's called centralization. Peripherization, when you do another movement, another type of movement, the symptoms then start to radiate more into the leg. So you've got more peripheral sensation. So you want to find a movement of either flexion or extension that centralizes their leg pain, that brings it back into the spine. So it makes their glute ache less or the hamstring ache less or their. So some people like McKenzie stuff, which is extension based exercise. Some people like flexion, so knees to chest, those sort of things. But it will depend on the individual as to what centralizes or peripheralizes that leg pain. Um, I think the other things I'd be thinking about would be distraction techniques. So I sometimes get people to put hot water bottles or ice packs on the other leg because that offers them a sense of distraction. And I've been recently playing around with some hip distraction techniques. So we're using some power bands uh, and trying to imagine pulling the head of the femur out of the acetabulum using a power band with the patient wide on the back that seems to work quite well and again i'm not sure as to what it's doing from a neurological perspective but that seems to centralize their leg pain and then finally mouth guards to help with the positioning of the jaw and tmj or is it more of a band-aid like orthotics uh, mouth guard 
um, and orthotics probably do fall into the same category. I um, used to be really, really big into them, the, the mouth guards, and used one for a, for a whole cycle of strongman training um, and had this thing in my head where it was, um, you know, it was, it was purely, purely placebo, probably just because I thought, well, Brian Shaw's wearing one, so it worked for me. <laughs> Um, and that was it. So that was that was genuinely it. I ordered some fancy one from the states, which probably was a lot more than the, the normal one. And I'm pretty sure I messed up the application biting into it. I put it in my mouth; it was too hot, and spat it back out, and then put it back in, and it didn't set right. So whatever effect it is. So I think it's like orthotics with a TMJ one. You'd have to go see someone and have like it really measured out, and it'd be very very expensive. But yeah, it probably falls into the same thing as. Um, as it's, it's twisted for a reason going on or some uh, elsewhere. Um, I'm guessing, Tarek, that you've got some jaw problems or you've got a client who's got jaw problems. Yeah, so um, we'll see. Aaron, have you got your phone next to you or handy? Yeah, I have, yeah. yeah. Cool. Right, so we'll do. I've got everybody on the call. I've got the names written down with the number. If you can go into Google and type in number, random number generator, please. So... Um, and this is put me on the spot. I'm not sure my uh, my phone skills are this. Um, you, have you got a Nokia 3210 or something? Or so? Yeah, I have. It's my drugs phone. <laughs> Not to say it's your grafting phone. And the number generator. And then you put it between one and eight. One. Eight. Cool. Generator. Right. Well, if you can hold it up to the screen so you can see, and there we go. And if you can tap it once, so it's it's saying, so tap it once. Yeah. And then back up to the screen, a bit higher, a bit higher. Number six, number six, Luke, Luke Hurst. You have won a trip to the Maldives. You'll be going on the <laughs> private jet. It will be a How many trips to the Maldives are free at the moment? They're just trying to get people flying again, aren't they? You've won that, but Luke, I will email you about that uh, because you have won yourself the um, online screening assessment with myself, um, which did advertise. So I'll email you about that um, as well. So um, feel bad for Hattie and Jimmy who have been coming for this entire time. They've been, been in there really hoping, I uh, was hoping it might go to one of them, but we'll, I'll, I'll speak to them in another time. I'll make the better. What's Luke that? works at my gym. Oh, right. <laughs> I'm Luke's manager, so he'll have to deliver with me when we go back to work. It's even more human. It's even more human about that. Issue. So, right. So they've, that, they've gained wealth in knowledge. Yeah. Yeah. So there's, no, there's no prize. You know, you can't, you can't give this stuff away. Do you want me to make you feel even worse, Jimmy? Is that when I, when, I initially, when I initially wrote the numbers out, I don't know if you could see that. But there was, somebody, there was somebody on the call who left. And then when they left, I scribbled the name out. And then you were actually initially number six as well. I don't know if you can see it. <laughs> <laughs> That's not, there's no, no word of a lie. You were actually initially Jimmy number six. Oh, Because he left for that and, and rewrote. So there's, there's, something wrong, there's, there's something all right there. But, all right, guys. So um, thanks so much for attending. These will all be on YouTube. Um, you know, they'll be all, all on YouTube so you can watch them uh, over and again. What's happened is obviously I've, uh, I kind of do that thing where you leave about 10 assignments to build up with uni and then um, worry why you've got to get all of them in the June. Um, Aaron, I'm sure you will be working in um, some capacity. Um, yeah, I mean, we're um, osteopaths apparently are key workers. I, I don't necessarily buy into that whole philosophy, but... Yeah, we've been able to, we, we close because it was morally and ethically the right thing to do. But I know a lot of osteopaths that have remained open throughout lockdown. Yeah. Um, I'm seeing a few people now just like a, a, an, a, an afternoon clinic, fully PPE'd up. Mm. Uh, plenty of washout time between clients so that I can disinfect myself and them and the beds and everything else from there. It's, to be honest with you, it's more, more trouble than it's worth. Um, but yeah, we've got quite a, we're doing an online side of the business now. Um, and I'm marking dissertations as we speak. That's why my eyes look like piss holes in the snow. <laughs> I'm spending my days reading 6,000 word dissertations. Nice. On, on craniosacral therapy. 
There's been no cranial sacral tear. Lots of ACLs. I've, I've, I'm, what I don't know about ACL reconstruction isn't worth knowing at this point. Mm -hmm. um, 